Okay, we're live. Hey, I have a date. Uh, Wednesday, 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 Wednesday,
And we are in Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. And we are in the second half of the book uh, of Ephesians. So that means we're in the practical side. That is, that is Paul's um, uh, way he writes. He always starts with doctrine and then he moves to the practical. And uh, so we are, we are in the practical in Ephesians. I would like to say publicly um, is I really appreciate uh, so much the Wainers uh, for their service here. Uh, Wayne is one of our deacons and rely on him heavily for his advice and uh, his information that he's able to glean. And then, of course, uh, Marie's very quiet in uh, her actions, but she does so much behind the scenes of contacting people and keeping uh, uh, people uh, 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 thinking about God and just checking in on them. And I was thinking about that today, and I just wanted to tell you publicly, uh, thank you. I'm sure you're not happy that you did that, but, um, <laughs> but let's turn the camera around so we can all see what she <laughs> she didn't do this. She went uh -huh. so, but uh, we're 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 so we're so thrilled for that. All right. So um, Ephesians chapter five, verses um, three through seven. So last week uh, you should have a handout. Last week we studied verses one and two. Uh, we learned to be followers of God as dear children. That means that we are to imitate God just as our children uh, imitate a parent. Uh, there was a song out by Pastor Pyre where he talked about this man's life, and he, he talked about how he followed his father, or maybe it was by the wilds, I can't remember, but anyways, that uh, the mother would say that as they would talk through the song a little bit, oh look, he's wearing his little tool belt, just like you are. And, and as little ones, maybe we remember our children, they would follow us around, or I remember me having a little bubble mower, if my dad had a bigger mower. And I would follow him around. And in the same way, we are to be imitators of God. We are to follow him and imitate him. We are to love as he loves. We are to walk as he walks. We are to talk as he talks. We are to live as he lives. Uh, we are to mimic the Father in all things. Now, we're not gods. We're not saying that, but we're to mimic uh, his attributes of who he is and we can through the power of the Holy Spirit. I hope that's transpiring in your life. So that's what we looked at last week. In the verses that we'll consider today, uh, we are also given another command. Now remember last week, I don't want to rehash the whole, the whole Bible study, but we were reminded that followers of God as dear children is not an option. It is a command. We are to follow or imitate uh, God as dear children. And in verse number 7 of tonight is the command. So even though we're going to study verses 3 through 7, 7 is actually the launching pad. So let's go to verse number 7 and look at that, and then we'll go back and look at 3, 4, 5, and 6. So verse number 7 says, Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Well, if we just read that verse, we would not know what he's talking about. But what he's talking about is, is don't be partakers of those that live in the world still. In other words, there ought to be a great change in your life. The things that you used to do, you don't do them anymore. Everything that you do now should be run through the filter of God's word. Will this make God happy? Find out what God likes and what? Do it. Thank you. Find out what God hates and what? Stay away from it. And it, 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 sanctification is that simple. So it isn't, well, I think that's okay. I think I can act like that. I think I can still do that. Just see what the Word says. And if the Bible says don't lie anymore, then don't lie. If it says don't swear anymore, then don't swear. If it says, if it says be a light, then be a light. Just find out what God hates and you hate it. And find out what God loves and follow that. So that's what that's saying here. He's ending it up in verse 7 to say, Be not therefore. Therefore always means what he was just talking about. And he was talking about don't be partakers in that type of activity. Uh, to, to sum up some of our thoughts, we are to imitate the Lord in every possible way. And we are to avoid imitating um, the actions and attitudes and the ways of the world. We're just, we're just to stay away from that. 
Now, we have to be in the world. Is that not true? Yes. What fools we are if we don't participate with the unsaved in the sense of being around them so we can get to know them. And now we don't participate like Christ. He, they said, uh, remember the Sadducees and Pharisees said to Christ, look where he's at. They said, he's in with the sinners. Well, that's not a bad thing. Jesus wasn't participating in their sin. He was in there teaching them what the Bible says and how that they can be saved. So we don't partake with them in the sense of the sin, but we go there so that we can be a light and salt. This passage will speak to us about what we should be doing as we live in this world. We have to distinguish the world. The world's beautiful. God's made it. Enjoy it. Enjoy the big puffy clouds and the nice weather and the fresh rain. And, uh, I was over and saw uh, Mrs. Roman's uh, Lord's uh, garden, and I was very excited about that. Those are things that we can enjoy. Wasn't excited about the rolls of Brussels sprouts, but I was I enjoyed the first seat. The other guy said, Who plants this to be Brussels sprouts? <laughs> they do. I just remember Brussels sprouts is what I used to throw my brother. <laughs> they were a perfect size. I didn't know people ate them. So, anyways, we're to enjoy those things. Enjoy life. Enjoy the walk. Enjoy the beautiful trees. Enjoy the flowers. I just took pictures the other day. I saw a butterfly on one of our flowers and took a picture of it because those are God's creations. Even in a fallen fallen world, it's still beautiful. Could you imagine what it must have been before the fall? Right. Uh, but anyways, we're, we're, we're to enjoy that world. We're not, to, we're not to enjoy the world's system under Satan because it's sin cursed. And all that's in it, the lust of the flesh, Pride of the life, we're not to enjoy those things. So remember, we are saints. Uh, when I was growing up Roman Catholic, I thought that you know you had to be pronounced a saint after uh, much money given and investigations done. But we are saints. What does that mean? It means we are sanctified. Sanctified means simply. Does anybody know? And shout out real loud for the live stream so you can hear you. But does anybody know what that means? To be sanctified. What? Set apart. That's exactly right, Glenn. It is means to be set apart. God has separated his people unto himself. And he expects us to be set apart unto him. Separation is not a dirty word. Some people think separation is all, oh, you know, separation is legalism. No. It's finding out what God loves and doing it, finding out what he doesn't like and doing it. We're to be set apart. For the Lord Jesus Christ. He has a plan and purpose for us. Because we are set apart ones, we no longer belong to the world of the darkness that's all around us. Is it not dark? It's dark. It's dark. And um, there is much evil there. I wonder all the evil that we don't see right. that is taking place. Mm -hmm. Think of all the wickedness, spiritual wickedness in high places that we don't see the bad. I think uh, Janet brought this up in our last prayer time that the wickedness is also in the realm that we can't see. Because we know that Satan, Lucifer, Satan hindered Michael in the battle in Persia. And it was not able to be seen. So we know that there's not only the, the, the evil that we see, but the evil that we don't see. I think if we knew all that was transpiring right now, it would be too overwhelming. But we're to stay away from that. We're not to be around that. Remember that Satan has a counterfeit for everything that God says good. So God says we're to love. We're counter so Satan's counterfeit is, okay, go ahead and love, but love the world. And God says don't love the world, but love the things that I love. So we're set apart. Because, because we are, we're not to live the way we used to. We have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2, 9 uh, you can take a look at that later, but that verse is talking about how that we can save and fall out unto his marvelous life. With that in mind, let's spend some time in these verses today. I want to make our Bible study around the command, Be ye not therefore partakers with them. Now what you want to do, if you want to have a further study, we don't have time tonight, uh, find yourself landing in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter number, uh, uh, oh, I forgot the chapter, it's actually chapter 6. 
verse 14 to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. And in there, you'll see how God explains what is separation. And he, he talks about the light from the dark and the satanic works to the good works. He, he points it out. He says, uh, uh, come out from among them. Be ye separate, saith the Lord. Come out from among them. And so we can learn that in a, if you'd like to take this uh, study a little bit further. So notice the challenge laid out in this text. Uh, there are actions we must avoid. There are actions that we must avoid. Let's take a look at those and read those together uh, in uh, chapter number 5, verses number 3 and 4. It says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you uh, as become the saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting which are not convenient, but rather a giving of thanks. Let's just go ahead and go ahead and read 5 and 6. For this ye know, so you already know this, it's not anything new he's saying to this church at Ephesus, and most likely most people here are very familiar with the Bible that are here tonight, that no whoremongers, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye there for partakers of that. So we see that it is beneath um, it is beneath the dignity of a saint to indulge in the sins that belong to the world of darkness. In other words, God says be like the eagles. Fly above the storms and uh, don't be like the raven or the vulture that eats what's dead. Don't eat roadkill. God says fly high. In other words, as saints, don't let it be named or don't indulge in the sins that are all around us. Some of which Paul names here. These sins mark the world in that day. So back in the church of Ephesus, back in when this was taking place, this is what was happening. These sins were prevalent in that city. You will see, as we look at those sins, they're as prevalent today. They are all around us, even today. And they still mark the world today. Sin and sinners never change. It's just repackaged. There's no new sin. It's just that the, the, in, in the way that we live today, we just see more of it. There was some sin that you only heard about, but now we see it just played out right in front of us. Because with one keystroke, you can go anywhere you want, to any dark corner. You can investigate any sin and see it almost live on your computer. We didn't have that before. But now, it's certainly out. Nothing is in the closet anymore. It is now condoned. So sinners in sin have never changed. We know that because we're sinners saved by grace. They merely continue down the path of depravity. How, how deep can sin go? There's no bottom. How high can the glory of God go in a person's life? There's no height. There's no bottom to the depravity. There's no height to how much we can serve the Lord and how much we can enjoy Him and how much joy we can have in Him. We'll never reach that height until we see Him face to face. They do as they are led by the spirit of this world and the flesh and the devil. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3, says that ye have been quickened. That word quickened means to be made alive. You were dead in trespasses and sins, where in times past you walk accordingly to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and our mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That's what we used to be. 
Before you were born again, that's what you were. You're no longer that. So don't partake in those sins is what Paul is saying. The world does what it does because it knows no other way. You do. You've been awakened. You've been brought back to life. Your spirit is now joined with his spirit. You no longer will spend eternity separated from God. But you will be with him for all of eternity. Things are different now. And because it's incapable, in, in, it's incapable, you cannot, of changing itself, even if it wanted to, which it doesn't, it can't change itself. But because of the Holy Spirit, we are changed. Have you noticed any difference in your life since you've been born again? Can you stand up or share? I know we're live streaming, so it's hard for them to hear. But we're here in this Bible study, and I want to make sure you can participate as much as possible without losing our live stream crowd. But what could you say has changed in your life? I'll start it off. Some of the language that I used to use, I don't use it anymore. It's unbecoming of a born again believer. Is there anything that you'd like to make a shout out? Can you hear me? I can hear you and then I'll repeat it. is a neutral word 
but in the context of our text, it's talking about the church at Ephesus, and they were publishing this towards evil. So that would be wrong. The word refers to greed and lust. It is, it is a desire to possess that which belongs to another. Verse number 5 clearly says that the covetous man is an idolater. Do you know what an idolater is? Does anybody give their thought on that? Okay, an idolater is somebody that elevates something. A statue could be, it could be a way of thinking, of worship, above God. And they seek it with all their being. So in other words, being an idolater is, 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 is replacing God with something. And that could be an actual stone thing, like a statue, or it could be a way of our lives. And the Bible says we're not to do that. It should not be named among us. We should not want, we should not want what God does not want us to have. In other words, we should not uh, want to be the richest person in the world. That, that should not be something that's a goal that's a, above God and we're just seeking and seeking and seeking it. We ought to be content with what God gives us and in, a, in, and in that contentment, uh, God will bless. So in verse number four, Paul warns against the sin of the tongue, which in reality are the sins of the heart. Now they're sins of the flesh, and that's what we just looked at now. Sins of the flesh are easy to see. Do you remember the prodigal son? Does anybody remember what the word prodigal means? It means wasteful. So he was a wasteful son. And his sins were very obvious. He took the money and he went and he lived a life that was wrong and he ended up in the pig pen. So it was evident that the sins of the flesh were able to see by all. But the other brother was a prodigal son too. Because his problem was not the flesh. He kept it hid and hid it, he wrapped it up in righteousness which was really unrighteousness. His sin was the sin of the spirit. He was angry against his brother, but yet nobody could see that. Sometimes our sin is not as obvious as the sin of the flesh. It can be bitterness, anger, hateful spirit. Uh, it can be those things. And so Paul says, okay, fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, that's evidently very easy to see in someone's life. But what about us? The word speaks in filthiness. The word speaks of crudeness. The way that we, we, we think in our mind. It speaks of those things that are dirty in nature. Listening to conversations that are unbecoming. We should just walk away from conversations that are not going to help us. One person said, if you're in a group and they begin to go the wrong way, just raise your hands and start waving them and say, stop! You think you would have the strength to do that? Well, of course not. So what happens sometimes is we get sucked into it. And those are sins of the Spirit. That we would listen to those conversations when we watch TV or view a movie or often there's filthiness in the action. We should turn it off. And we should walk away from it and have no part of it. Nothing appears to be sacred anymore. God's name is taken in vain, sexual innuendos, and a thinly veiled reference is in a lot of what we see today. And may I say, too, even in what we would call good channels, sometimes it portrays happiness can be attained without God. It can be attained in a relationship. So the movie's all about girl meeting guy, guy meeting girl, and everything's happy now. That's not fulfillment. That is, that is lust that we would find our satisfaction outside of the Lord. Foolish talking, it means silly speech. It refers to talk that we associate with someone who is mentally deficient. If you meet somebody that is challenged with a brain injury or has a birth from birth as a situation that goes on in their life, something took place where they cannot 
function when they talk, you can tell from their speech and uh, maybe they never rise above the age of four or five in their mind. We, we, we see what they say is silly speech. It, it doesn't make sense. It's, it's babbling. And it speaks to us about the use of obscenities or crude words in our day-to-day -day speech. There's never an excuse for a Christian to curse or to use what we call Christian swear, like, oh, my word. Saying, oh, my word is the same as really using the words like uh, the Lord's name in vain. By using that type of speech, our speech should be above board, and it should be uh, pleasing to the Lord. Another one here is jesting. Now this one uh, is one that easily takes place, especially around men. I don't know, I'm not around women that much to hear their conversation, but I would say that around men, I see it happen often. And I've been a, part, a partaker of that as well. Um, the word refers to speech that falls into the same realm as foolish talking. But this word carries the idea of turning around. So it speaks of the kind of wit or talk that takes something that is said or done, no matter how innocent it is, and turn it into something that is suggestive. suggestive. In other words, something that would not be, in the context of the conversation, be dirty, but we're able to turn it to get everyone to know what we're talking about, to turn it to something that is wrong. Something that would cause our minds to go to something that is filthy or obscene. And we ought not to jest. We, we have that with jesters. The ones that used to entertain, they were magicians and clowns. and They were silly on what they did. It refers to those who twist everything into something dirty or some kind of sexual innuendo. This kind of dirty speech always comes from a dirty heart, a dirty heart. The Bible says this in Luke chapter 6 and in verse number 45, it says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. That's found in Luke chapter number 6, verse number 45. So we see that really when we bring forth or our speech or our manners, is it either comes out of one of these two treasures. If our heart is dark with sin and our mind is, is, is thinking on those things, then that will naturally come out. But a man of good treasure, he does not have that problem. Uh, remember verse number three, that's very important. The Bible says, let's take a look at it in Ephesians chapter five. And in verse number three says, that it may be well, oops, that's, verse, that's chapter number six, I'm sorry. Chapter number five, verse number three says, uh, but fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, here's the part, let it, let it not be once. How many times is once? Do we know? <coughs> is what? One. It is one. Not the name around us once named among you as become a saint. When God saved us, he gave us the provision to be cleaned up. And God wants us to be cleaned up so that we could have an influence. So he wanted this, these saints that were in, in Ephesus to not leave the world and act like everybody that they knew before was leprous, so to say. They wanted them to come out from the world, be part of the church, so they could hear the scriptures, the scrolls, the scriptures, and then during the day to go back into the world but in the world, people would see a difference in them. When you were saved, Lord willing, people saw a difference in you. They noticed right away there was something different about your mannerisms, your talk. And so God does not want us to become an enemy of the cross by going back into that. 
And so he was trying to teach this group um, of, of saints that everything is different now. And God wants them to be salt and light. Now, why do you think he used those two terms in the scriptures? To be salt and light. What do you, what do you, what do you think those things do? What, tell, me, tell me what light and salt, how that would be something that a Christian ought to be manifesting in their life. A light is something you can see and salt is something that preserves. Excellent. Let's do the light first. Light is something they can see. They are dark and dead in their trespasses and sins. And the Bible says in the book of Corinthians, unless the light of the gospel shines into their hearts, there will be no change. So when they see you, they don't see you. They see who? Christ. Christ. And Christ is described as what in the scriptures? The light of the world. And so we manifest that light. We're now in his marvelous light, the scripture says. We're, 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 we're alive in him, and because of that, people ought to see that. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praise of him who have called you out of darkness into his what? Marvelous light. There's a guy that I was uh, talking to about traveling neighborhood Bible time. And when he came up to talk to me, of course, the first thing we talked about is, what's your name? And his name was Marvelous. <laughs> Marvelous. But that was his name, was Marvelous. And God says that we have been taken out of darkness into his marvelous light. Show your light. Uh, you know the song. I'm going to let this light shine this little light. Don't hide it under what? Bushel. Bushel. Don't what else? Don't hide it, but use it so people can see that in their life. But if the Ephesian saints didn't understand that they need to come out from those sins, they would look just like the former life. And so what would be the difference? If you're a fornicator and adulteress, Adultery. If, if, if that's your life, then how are people going to see the wonderful change that can take place in their life? So God uses the word light. And the other one, now salt is a preservative, but I'm looking at salt in a different way. It is true. It's a preservative. I'm glad that it is. But in the context, why do we want our life to be like salt? Okay, it adds flavor, so I'll, I'll take that as well. I wasn't thinking that, but it does. It preserves. It gives flavor, because we use it all the time. And it makes you thirsty. You ever have a good ham? Me and my wife have a good ham, and we eat it up, and then about a half an hour later, guess what we're saying to each other? Man, are we thirsty? That salt, as a preservative, as flavor, also makes us go and get water. And so if you're a salty Christian, then when people are around you, they're going to desire the thirst of what you have, the scriptures, the water of the word. So when you're around people, you ought to be salty. They ought to want or inquire about your life. Sometimes people will say to me when I meet them and I I don't know them, I don't, I don't see them often, but then I begin to start a relationship with them, and maybe it's in a large group, this happened a lot when I was in the military or at work. Uh, people would not come to me when we're in the middle of work and there's a, a big group around, but privately they would come and ask questions about the Bible. Have you ever had that happen to you? Somebody just says, hey, what about this? I have my uncle. One time asked me, he would never ask me this probably in a group, but when he got me privately, he said, some people at work say you die and you just get thrown in the grave and that's all there is. What do you say? See, salt. It wasn't anything I was doing. It was the light of Christ that produces salt and light. And so in the privacy, Nicodemus came to Jesus. Because of the salt. If you read the last verse 
of, 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 of John chapter 2 before Nicodemus comes, Jesus says, I gave the gospel to a large group, and when he went off by himself, he said, those that are interested will come. And that's what happened. They came. I remember my cousins saying to me privately, as they got me alone away from the crowd, they said, you must have done something really bad to become a Christian. They didn't know what it meant to be a Christian, but they realized that there was something different. It wasn't me. What was it? Light and salt because God changes those that allow him, allow us to be changed. So uh, that's important. If we're going to have an impact in our community, on our street, at work, people are watching you. And when they sense trouble, they will come to you privately. And they'll ask. And you'll be able to share why your life is different. You're not going to say, well, because I turned over a new leaf. Or I had a 12-step program. No, you're going to say, because Jesus Christ reigns in my heart. I am now born again. And that is the answer to the great change that you see. Take your Bibles, if you would, very quickly here. Turn to uh, 1 Peter. This is our memory verse. Um, I'm not confident enough to do it out right now. You know it, but I would have to say it very slow and deliberately think through it. And But in 1 Peter, uh, chapter number 3, oh, boy, I didn't even have a text wrong. And then it must be 3, what is it? 15. 15, thank you. Oh, my goodness. No, that's not what I want. Um, is, is that? No, um, it's the verse that says, uh, about, um, oh my goodness, I, 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 have, I have to show you how much I have to memorize. Oh, you know why? Because I'm in James. That's the problem. Oh, my wife's going to tell me all the way home. Why do you do that? Uh, I still can't find it. What is it? Is it the sanctified? Yeah. 3.15. Okay, I'm in second Peter. Okay, 3.15. Okay, thank you. And I know this verse, I know it. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to everyone that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. In other words, if you are salt and light, people are going to ask you, what is that reason that you have this hope? Why is that? And then we'll end with Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, and Colossians 4, 6. In Colossians 3, 16, the scripture says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. That's what's supposed to take like for a Christian. Let me ask you, is the word of Christ dwelling in you richly? Is he the preeminence? Is he the priority in your life? Teaching you and admonishing you. And then out of that, you're singing songs and embracing your heart. People see that. And then, of course, in Colossians 4, 6, it says, Let your speech, speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer Every day. So light and salt is the result of the changed life. But if your life doesn't change, they can't see your life. It's diminished. It's diminished. Right now, we see that there's light. When you have a lot of salt and light in your life,
And as you become that light, people will be drawn to the light. And then when they come, it's because they're thirsty to know what is it that makes you different than them. And you'll be able to say, the difference is this. The difference is Christ. And the opportunity will come for you to share that with them. So the Bible study is a simple one. What must we avoid? And that is the sins that are mentioned in chapters uh, 5, verses 3 and 4. And then, of course, we'll end with the end of verse number 7. Be ye not, therefore, partakers with them. Don't let it be named among you as saints at all. All righty. Well, thank you for uh, being part of our live stream. And the invitation is simple. Why don't you examine your own life and find out how bright is your light? I know sometimes I have to clean the light bulb because so much dirt and dust gets on it. I didn't realize how much light it is not showing anymore. And when I clean it, it's bright. Maybe you need to clean your light bulb. Maybe you need to get fresh salt. I don't know what that is, but make that decision. What we're going to do here at Faithway Baptist Church is we're going to go ahead and uh, get together right now and we're going to pray uh, for the prayer requests that we have and for those that we already know. And I encourage you that are listening on live stream to gather together as a family and take this next five or ten minutes in prayer together, praying for uh, those that are hurting, those that are uh, excited and happy with in, in an event that's going on in their life, which rejoices them as well, and pray that God would change us and make us soften our